our family, we always had, you know, wine on the table. It was just a kind of a European thing to, to happen. My first experience of wine was actually uh, as a baby because I was born in a Catholic hospital in, on December the 8th and the nuns needed somebody to represent the Christ child, so they used me, and I guess I wasn't behaving too well, so they poured a little bit of uh, Samir white down my throat. Uh, my name is Alex Golitsen. My name is Jeanette Golitsen, and we're at Quill Cedar Creek Vintners. I was born in 1939 in France. I was born actually in Saumur in the Loire Valley. And once the Germans occupied France, then we went back to Paris, and I spent the entire war in, in Paris itself. And we came over to the United States in 1946. Our sponsor was my uncle, Andre Chelichev, who was you know, a very famous winemaker down in California. He worked for BV for many, many years. He'd gotten there in 1936 because he was hired by George Latour when he was in France. Uh, George Latour needed a winemaker, especially right after Prohibition. And so Andre came over then. I spent a lot of time as a kid going up the Napa Valley where my Uncle Andre was, was working. I remember walking, walking through the vineyards and running around in the tanks at Boyo Vineyards, and it was, uh, it was quite the experience. I have known Andre for a long time, uh, since Al and I met when we were so young. I used to go to the vineyards with them, and we'd have big barbecues over at Uncle Andre's house. And I met Alex. Uh, when we were both in high school. We were a blind date when I was almost 16 and he was 17. And we've been married 54 years, so it worked. Jeanette and I were married in 1963. And uh, in 1967, we moved up to Washington. And that was pretty close about the time that Andre started to consult for Chateau St. Michel. I would complain to him that, you know, wine was really not available here because Washington in those days was really kind of a backwater in terms of even delicatessen or wine or anything else. So a friend of mine and I used to go down to Portland, Oregon, to buy wine because you couldn't really find anything up here that was really suitable. So after hearing my complaints for a few times, he said, look, he said, I'll get you a barrel, I'll get you lined up with a vineyard, and I'll teach you how to make wine. And of course, being who he was, we all decided to do Cabernet. We got uh, picked up seven barrels from Uncle Andre. They were used barrels from BV, as a matter of fact. And uh, I bought a dairy tank and basically started making the wine like that. We were very primitive, but you know, it doesn't take an awful lot in terms of capital to actually uh, make some wine. It's it just, you know, it requires some know-how and I had a lot of help from Uncle Andre. Uh, we never produced, you know, the wine the same quality as we're doing right now in those days, but we never uh, had any mistakes either. They were always consistently good at, you know, high 80s, low 90s level, uh, but, but good. It's still considered, you know, in the world of wine, pretty good stuff. Uncle Andre was really not basically encouraging me. In fact, he was probably discouraging me from starting a winery because he knew the risks associated with it. But uh, he uh, still, you know, nevertheless thought the, the, the wine was quite good. Uh, so we started the winery and did our first crush in 79. Back in those days, we kept the wine two years in barrel and then two, two years in bottle after it was bottled. I made a barrel of wine each year from 74 through 77. He thought the wine was quite good. We decided to start a winery, just a small scale. Well, Alex was always anxious to get out of corporate America and uh, just thought it would be a wonderful little side business. So in 1983, we ended up at a wine dinner put on by the Brotherhood of the Knights of the Vine and ended up sitting next to a gentleman, Jerry, uh, who was uh, the head of uh, the Enological Society of the Pacific Northwest. It was a consumer group that had started back around those times. And they had a competition every year. And they said, well, you know, why don't you enter your wine? My uncle had told me before that, he said, do not do that. He said, because it's a huge amount of risk. We, for some crazy reason, decided that we we're just still gonna do it. And so we did it and we, we got a gold medal and a grand prize. And those days they, were, they had seven judges, one of which was Gaia. You know, so we, we did it pretty well. And that kind of launched us a little bit. In 1979, we made, a, you know, 150 cases and then the, slowly grew the production bit by bit up to about eight or 900 cases 
at which point we stopped because that was probably pretty much about all I could handle in terms of just having a full-time day job and plus on top of that doing the winery. If you're going to start a winery, keep your day job for a long time. So I did the day job and the winery for about 15 years. Washington's a very, very young wine region. It, it, you know, basically, you know, 40 years ago almost really didn't exist. Uh, there were no vineyards, there were very few wineries in, in production. It, it takes a while for any kind of a, an area to really develop a reputation, and we're in the process of doing that right in Washington. Napa basically was, I remember even back in, you know, the 50s and 60s, it was not really, really well known. Uh, that much worldwide uh, and basically achieved its reputation with that tasting in 1973 in, in France. So they're fairly new by comparison to Bordeaux, where Bordeaux has been around for you know, a good 150 years, ever since the 1865 classification. We were the 12th bonded winery in the state after Prohibition, and now there's over 900. So we were there really right at the beginning of the whole thing. Uh, Quosita Creek name comes from a little creek that's up north of Marysville from about maybe 15 miles away from here. I remember going to a seminar years ago given by a professor of marketing from the University of California. Uh, and he said basically, you know, to be a successful business you had to have three things. You had to have a uh, unique value proposition, the capability of being to execute it and still survive financially, and you have to get, to get the word out. Well, our unique value proposition is basically uh, Cabernet that is produced on a consistent basis somewhere in 98 to 100 points as defined by the wine advocate at a very reasonable price compared to other wines of the same quality. We've been very, very fortunate to be able to achieve uh, some very, very high scores. We now, to this date right now, have six 100 point scores from. Robert Parker's uh, Wine Advocate magazine. Uh, it, it has definitely helped us. It, it was exciting to get the scores because you know it substantiated what we were we were doing as far as the vineyard and the winery. It was also obviously really great as far as the business was concerned. And you know when we produced uh, two 100 point wines from the 2002 and 2003 vintages, that was uh, really a seminal moment for us because we. We knew now that we could, A, we could do it, and B, it was wonderful for the reputation of the winery. And so, you know, we always believe in uh, demand rather than push. You know, that people want your wine and you don't have to go out and really and look for customers, they come to you. And that's what quality does. We are able to do all this because of the fact that we have, we're in Washington State, the uh, vineyards are considerably less expensive, like, you know, maybe 15% of what they are in Napa, but they produce fruit that is, you know, equally as good. Uh, so our, our costs are very, very good. And this, once you get the quality, then getting the word out really basically was a function of the publications in the wine industry. The driving force behind our winery becoming really world-class is our son, Paul. Even as a, as, you know, as a young person, he was always interested in wine. In 1985, we went to France, and Uncle Andrea set us up with some visits in Bordeaux. One of his friends invited us out to lunch at his chateau, uh, Chateau La Louvière. And uh, we had lunch there, and we walk in, and there's like, you know, 14 wines for us to try, and we tried them all, Paul tried them all, and he was like 15 at the time. And uh, we were kind of worried that he was, to, you know, was going to go to sleep during the during the lunch uh, well he, he did fine and uh, when we got back in the car we were driving off he's sitting in the back seat and he said dad he says you know he says I really like this lifestyle and that's I think that's what really kind of got him enthusiastic he came to work for the winery full-time in 1992 and he'd already had you know several years of experience just at, when the winery was small uh, and I retired in 1994 from Scott paper and so we were able to, to work on this together. We, you know, we put, got ourselves uh, more space by building a, a building. We, we make a very, very good team. He's uh, the artistic portion of the, the duo. And 
I'm kind of the technical person of the duo because I have a chemical engineering degree and so I'm familiar with, you know, with technology. The, the other thing that I have that, you know, that works well is the fact that I had worked for a consumer product company for years and we're able to understand exactly what you know, makes things work. Paul has got an incredible palette. He is very creative in terms of doing different things in the winery and trying uh, you know, different options. And uh, he is totally uncompromising as far as quality is concerned. He's got tan and control. We have a lot of tan in the wine, but he has control over it. And it, it makes for a marrying of a beautiful wine. It is a business, but we do not let business considerations affect what we do in the winery. Everything is all about quality. Our competition from California and uh, uh, Bordeaux is based primarily on, from a point of view of quality, is that we can produce wines that are every bit as good, uh, but we are in a totally different niche from the point of view of price. And that makes us really just, you know, totally uh, totally competitive uh, from the point of view. We don't have to go out and really market the wine. Uh, it's basically just people call up and s sign up and say, we'd like to get on your mail list. And we say, well, that's fine. We, you know, we'll be able to help you maybe in a year or two. And uh, that, that just has grown from there. It's been really, really successful from that point. Uh, you know, when you start looking at some of the cult wines, you're talking about 400, 500, 850, 1200 dollars. Bordeaux in a good year, 1500. Hey, you know, we're we're just in a totally different league. Uh, you can do that kind of thing uh, if you're a California cult if you have small production, but basically your um, market really, really shrinks when you start talking about that kind of money. We taste competitive wines all the time. In fact. Uh, you know, Paul is always trying to educate our winemaker, assistant winemaker, and uh, everybody that actually works in, in production of the wine, in fact, really actually the whole company. And so what he does is on a very regular basis, he ends up having tastings. They're not blind, but they also are, are very, very expensive, top of the line wines so that people that work for this company can understand what it is that, you know, that we're doing and how we fit in with other people. We produce only Cabernet Sauvignon. We produce actually four wines. Uh, our flagship wine is the Columbia Valley Cabernet, which is primarily from the Horse Seven Hills ABA, as far as vineyards are concerned. Uh, we produce a smaller amount uh, of Cabernet from our property in Red Mountain. And uh, then we make a Bordeaux blend called Palangat, which is named after my wife's maiden name. And then uh, we produce a wine every year of whatever did not fit into those other three categories. And we, it's, it's called our red table wine. And it also does very, very well. But of course, we're not able to produce the really, really high scoring wines without being able to declassify some of the wine into a, a, you know, the red table wine vintage. That was one of the, the main things I think that Uncle Andre recommended. He says, if you're going to make wine, he says, make one wine, one varietal. Because otherwise it gets to be psychologically and intellectually confusing. If you're making 10 to 12 different wines at the same time, it, you know, it's, it's hard enough when you produce one wine because on any given vintage, we got, you know, probably 20, 25 different blocks of Cabernet and a little bit of Merlot and a little bit of Cabernet Franc. And so there's basically separate wines until you blend it all together. And uh, if you're trying to do that with you know, multiple varietals, it's, it's just an impossible task to really do it well. We're totally focused strictly always on Cabernet and we'll always do that. Um, of the wines we make, you know, uh, two of them, the Palangat and the uh, Red Table Wine, which are declassified wine, they are uh, Bordeaux blends. We have found that, you know, with the right clonal selection, the right vineyard, and uh, the kind of quality that you can get from, from these places, uh, that Cabernet Sauvignon 100% wine is really the best. Uh, and it's, it's pretty consistent. If you take a look at, you know, Bordeaux, Bordeaux uses a lot of Merlot because they can't get the Cabernet right. 
and so they have to blend it out. But if you get Cabernet ripe on a consistent basis, it's, it stands alone, and it's, it's just it, it, it could be texturally wonderful and wonderful as far as flavor and aroma, and it just has everything necessary to, to be a 100% varietal wine. Our flagship Columbia Valley Cabernet Sauvignon sells for $140 a bottle. Uh, Gillitson sold for 120, I believe. The Palin got I think 95, and the Red Table wine usually around 40. And so we have you know a good spectrum of you know different offerings for different people. We're definitely not into ego trips. I mean, we still consider this you know we we love quality, uh, but we, and but we also want to have a business that's that, that's really good and. Uh, I like the idea that, you know, regular people can once in a while afford this kind of a wine as opposed to something that costs $2,000 and is totally unreachable for practically everybody except the very, very wealthy. We started off getting grapes from a place in Grandview called Otis Vineyard. Uh, that was our first 1979. That was the one where we got the grand prize. Uh, then they couldn't produce any more grapes from us, so then we started to get grapes from Cayona uh, and uh, Ciel de Cheval. And by 1986, we were kind of basically, because there weren't that many vineyards, you know, there's a lot of demand from different wineries, so you can only you know, get so much per vineyard. And so in 1986, we ended up being acquainted with uh, Paul Shampoo, and he was managing Mercer Vineyard, and he had a uh, first writer of feudal contract of the vineyard ever sold. And so he put together a group of us and we bought uh, a shampoo vineyard. And we started off with, you know, about, if I remember correctly, about 9% from Pulsita. And now we're, we own two thirds of it. That's about a 180 acre vineyard, so we got about 120 acres. And then 2001 and two, we planted 17 acres on Red Mountain. And uh, then we got purchased about five acres right across the street from Shampoo on a south-facing slope called Palangat. And uh, that's where we are as far as the state vineyards are concerned right now. We purchased some wine and some grapes also from Lake Wallula Vineyard and from uh, Wallula. The, the, the scores that we get from publications are very important. Uh, I think there's still uh, a lot of people that really subscribe to that. These people are professionals, and they, they understand wine, and uh, they can be re relied upon, not for exactly this, you know, completely the numerical score, but for the general range of the fact, you know, about how good the wine is. We've taken a look at, the, you know, the statistics of what they do in terms of uh, um, grading wines, and then they're, they're pretty darn good. We're very fortunate from the point of view that with the kind of scores we've gotten from all the publications is that uh, we really have a lot of demand for our wine. Uh, we really don't have to go out and uh, sell it an awful lot. We end up with uh, people calling up to get on our mailing list and uh, the, that's how basically the business has grown for the, for the most part. And that's been really successful for us and it's certainly from a business standpoint a really wonderful thing. That's one of the things we were lucky at when we started to grow the winery. It was the same uh, time that regulations kind of basically changed the United States. When we started the winery, uh, you could ship to very, very few states. Uh, and now I think you can ship to like 37 or 38 states and uh, that's an awful lot of business. Uh, well, the mail, it kind of grows by itself. People, you know, uh, get on the, our website and, uh, and sign up. And that, it's as simple as that. We are not uh, really set up here for, particularly for visitors. We welcome visitors here, especially people who already are basically part of our uh, mailing list, and they're, especially if they're from out of state. Uh, but generally speaking, we, you know, we're kind of here by ourselves. We're not in Woodenville where all the wineries are, and so. Uh, and we're, we're small, we're just really not set up to, to, to really do that. So the, the mail list has kind of grown on its own without, uh, you know, the one-on-one the -on -one relationship. The strategy basically as far as growth is concerned is, you know, as we had uh, grapes available, we grew it. 
assuming at the same time, you know, that uh, we knew our limitations. Uh, making gigantic leaps in terms of production is, you know, it's very, very counterproductive. As the mail list has grown, as our business has grown, we have slowly uh, grown our volume. Um, and that's, you know, you always want to kind of be a little bit behind. Our winery is in uh, Western Washington. There's a lot of wineries in Western Washington that basically get their food from Eastern Washington. It's uh, a little inconvenient, but not really hugely. Uh, what you have to do is you have to make a, a 500 mile trip about at least once a week to see what's going on over there and then uh, pick the grapes at the right time and they get put in a truck and hauled over here and you, you make the wine over here. So it's, it, there is some inconvenience to it, but it's, it's totally doable. What's, what's missing, I think, uh, from that kind of a program is that you really don't have the, the beauty of the vineyard surrounding you. But, you know, you have to compromise sometimes in life. Our company ends up playing a lot of defense. Uh, for instance, because of climate change and the possibility of heat waves in our vineyards, we put in some spray systems at low volume, so we're not overwatering the grapes, but it will allow us to be able to knock six, seven degrees of temperature off of the vineyard in, in case there's a huge heat spike, which has already happened in 2015 and is, is coming probably more and more as time goes on. We're very proud of the fact that we've done this with a family business. It's been wonderful from the family standpoint also because we've never had the empty nest syndrome. When our kids grew up, uh, Paul was our winemaker uh, one of our daughter's uh, husbands is our general manager, uh, and uh, our other daughter still lives here, so everybody is still together, and that's, that's one of the best things as far as starting this winery is concerned, is that nobody had to wander off somewhere to make a living. The girls have been super, too. We have two daughters that uh, help out, and they do a lot of the um, tours and release parties and whatnot. They love doing that. So there's something for everyone to do in our little group. Working with family is not a challenge at all. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's very good. We have a lot of respect for each other and we are totally on the same page. We're not having any kind of conflicts. We are just dedicated to making great wine as, as best and best we can. And uh, that's, once you get that settled, uh, you know, and, and it was never really any kind of conflict. That was just the, what we wanted to do, and uh, once you have that kind of an attitude, everything flows from that. Well, I remember reading about a Italian winery where the founder was like 90 years old. His son uh, had a PhD in viticulture and enology, and he finally let him do something in the winery when the man had hit 62. So that, that, is, that is not the way you want to do it. Paul right now, however, has developed into being very technically astute. He's, he's very, very good at it, and he makes gigantic use of laboratories to make sure that uh, everything is uh, you know, done correctly and turning out to correctly. We spent a huge amount on, on labs. You know, we never really had that much of a transition. We kind of worked together, and uh, then you know, about three years ago, I basically retired, so he totally, he was running it before that. I, you know, uh, I, I participate right now still in you know, the tastings and, the, you know, the blending trials, but basically, you know, what, all we're doing is, you know, saying, all right, Paul, you're right. It, it is it's wonderful to have a business like this and you know and you dream of the fact that it would be carried on for generations and generations uh like for example the antinori family in italy have been making wine for like 600 years i'm afraid that the future does not hold that for us with climate change i think that's going to be almost impossible uh, there's a huge amount of danger associated with the climate change uh in eastern washington for particularly heat waves which would cut come to the point where they are bad enough that they would not only damage the fruit for a year, but start killing the vines. I don't know if multi-generational planning is really even capable of uh, being 
uh, used anymore because it's, it's just going to the weather is going to be just so unpredictable. You can try and do whatever you can, which is what we have done to mitigate this, but it's, you know, you only have so much capability of adaptation, then you have to just either go somewhere else or stop.